session of this program for this year. Um, it's really exciting to be here with you all. I think we all enjoy these sessions so much. This morning, we have a special treat for you. Uh, we have Don McLaughlin, who um, we most of us know as the former Dean of the School of Music, but there's a bit more to his life than that. So with that brief introduction, I will turn it over to Don and let him tell us all about his adventures. Don, over to you. Well, good morning, Diane, and hi, everyone. I'm looking at some uh, very familiar faces up here on the screen. A lot of friends. I hope you're still my friends after you see this video. And I hope you don't fall asleep. I hope you find it to be somewhat interesting. Well, having said that, I'll, uh, I think what we do is just roll it. Good morning, everyone. When Margaret Boonstra and Diane Haynes invited me to make a presentation for the ILR Adventures in Living class, I was hesitant to accept. I was concerned that my life's journey in the world of academia wouldn't be very interesting compared to the real adventures others have shared regarding their careers in the military, the diplomatic service, commercial aviation, and politics, for example. But when I took time to reflect on my experiences, I realized that I've been very fortunate to meet and work with some people who I think you will find interesting. So my musical odyssey that I'm going to share with you will be less about me and more about recognizing and celebrating some truly extraordinary people from the wide world of music and other arts. I'll also tell you about some of the wonderful members of my family. In addition, during this presentation, I will share information about some books I think you'll find interesting. As I began preparing this presentation, I soon recalled a statement from one of my favorite poems, Little Getting, by T.S. Eliot. We shall not see our exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive at the beginning and know the place for the first time. As the process continued, I was reminded of another statement from a plaque that hangs by my desk. It says, our lives are woven by the weavers of time in patterns we cannot see. For indeed, as the fabric of my story took shape, I was fascinated by the way certain threads would reappear over and over again. So where to begin? I've decided to start with my family name and the question people always have about it. They'll say, that's sure an unusual spelling. Is it Scottish or Irish? So here's the answer. In the mountains of Scotland's west coast, on the Hebrides Islands, the ancestors of the McLaughlin family were born. Lachlan in Old Gaelic means literally Norway. When Mac is added, it means son of Lachlan, which was the favorite Christian name of the royal house of O'Neill in Northern Ireland. A branch of the O'Neill family took the surname McLaughlin and became rival kings of the O'Neills. The McLaughlins then immigrated to Scotland in the 11th century and located near Loch Fyne, which is about 30 miles from modern day Glasgow as shown on this map. The clan McLaughlin took part in the Jacobite Risings as loyal supporters of the Stuart Kings of Scotland, specifically the so-called pretender Bonnie Prince Charlie. The 17th chief of the clan was killed at the Battle of Culloden in 1746. Several years ago, I had an opportunity to visit the Culloden battlefield. These images include the spot where the McLaughlin clan chief is buried. Following the Jacobite defeat, an English ship sailed up Loch Fine and shelled Castle Lachlan, forcing the chief's family to abandon their residence. And in Edinburgh, the McLaughlin's tartans were burned. 
Many assumed that the clan chief's land would be forfeited because of his support of Bonnie Prince Charlie. But interestingly, the chief's son, Donald McLaughlin, was allowed to keep his lands. Castle Lachlan is located on the eastern shore of Loch Prime. The original castle, which dates back to the 13th century, is now in ruins. The new castle Lachlan, which stands about a 10-minute walk from the ruinous old castle, is the modern seat of the McLaughlin clan. It was built in the late 18th century, with construction overseen by Donald McLaughlin. The castle has been divided in two. The current laird, Ewan John McLaughlin, and his family reside in one part, and the second part is available for rent. Here you see the McLaughlin coat of arms with the motto, strong and faithful, and two of the cousins. <coughs> there is also an image of a McLaughlin clansman by the Victorian artist R. R. McEan that was published in 1845. I published this, I purchased this several years ago at a rare bookstore in Philadelphia. And now to the spelling of my name. Spelling variations are a very common occurrence in records of early Scottish names. They result from the inaccurate translations that many names went through over the course of various English occupations of Scotland. This has resulted in over 250 different spellings of the name, including mine, M-C-G-L-O-T-H-L-I-N. So there you have it. I grew up in Pittsburgh, Kansas, so let me tell you just a little bit about this place. Plus, most people don't know anything about it. Pittsburgh is located in Crawford County in the southeast corner, corner of Kansas, about 10 miles east of the Missouri border and 15 miles north of the Oklahoma line. Pittsburgh sprang up in the fall of 1876 on a railroad line being built through the neighborhood. It was named after Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh owes much of its growth and prosperity to the production of what was in the world's most needed commodity, namely coal. As shown on this map, Pittsburgh and this corner of Kansas was underlaid with a huge supply of high-grade bituminous coal. At the time, expert engineers gave their opinion that it would last for over 200 years. To dig the coal, laborers were needed. The city fathers soon began a concerted effort to bring coal miners from the coal-producing nations of Europe. Broadsides were posted, stating, progress, prosperity, and coal go hand in hand, and Pittsburgh has no fear of famine or shortage for years to come. Steamship companies sent agents throughout Europe to enlist workers, underwriting one-way passage to the United States. And from 1880 through 1916, Huge waves of immigrants came to the coal fields of southeast Kansas, making it their new home. In all, over 50 nationalities came to mine coal. The area soon became known as the Little Balkans. Before long, there were 133 deep shaft mines employing 11,000 men. In addition, 42 of the world's largest steam shovels employing another 1,500 men were being used to uncover the shallow veins of coal through a process known as strip mining. Together, this workforce produced 8 million tons of coal annually valued at $15 million. Since Pittsburgh was the center of the coal mining industry, the main offices of nearly all the coal companies were located there. The miners and their families lived in the 25 small mining towns shown here. To serve this commerce, the tracks of four railroads ran through the town, the Frisco, the Missouri Pacific, the Santa Fe, and the Kansas City Southern. The original shops and yards of the KCS built in 1896 covered about 300 acres and employed nearly 1,300 people. And the railroad even had its own baseball team and shop band. Given this environmental mix, of the various, very dangerous mining industry and four railroads. It's not surprising that at the beginning of the 20th century, Pittsburgh was also the most heavily unionized city in Kansas. Eugene Debs, shown here, who was an American socialist, political activist, trade unionist, and one of the founding members of the industrial workers of the world, lived only 14 miles away in Girard, the county seat. 
Note his statement here. I am opposing a social order in which it is possible for one man who does absolutely nothing that is useful to amass a fortune of hundreds of millions of dollars, while millions of men and women who work all the days of their lives secure barely enough for a wretched existence. In addition to the industrial speculators who began investing heavily in the region's mineral resources, the city fathers hired architects from New York, Chicago, and St. Louis to design multi-story brick commercial buildings suitable for a major city. The architects also designed impressive schools and houses of worship, and civic buildings, beautiful parks, and stately private homes. Given the importance of labor unions in Pittsburgh, it's interesting to note that the handsome large public library shown here is one of the few funded by Andrew Carnegie that does not bear his name. In summary, Pittsburgh had quickly become the most important industrial center in Kansas and its fourth largest city. It is to this area that my mother's and father's families immigrated. My mother's family name is Kirkwood. Her great-grandfather, John Kirkwood, immigrated to the U.S. from Lancashire, Scotland, which was a major coal mining area near Glasgow. He initially settled in Maryland, where he engaged in mining. He then moved his family to Pittsburgh, where he served as mine foreman for the large Weir Coal Company. His sons, John T. and Archibald, also became involved in mining. John T., shown here with my grandfather, Arthur, who was wearing a little Lord Fauntleroy suit, became the mine foreman in a small community named after the family, Kirkwood. His family lived in this impressive house, which was a center for activities in the mining community. On April 29, 1917, my mother, Bonnie, was born to Arthur and Ruby Robbins Kirkwood in the small community of Minden Mines, Missouri, where Grandpa was working as a coal miner. Our fellow Oak Hammock resident, Nancy Wood's family, was also from there. My father's great-grandfather, William McLaughlin, immigrated to Scotland to Quebec and then moved to Kentucky. His son, my great-grandfather, Richard Peyton McLaughlin, grew tired of farming and moved to the small Missouri town of Lynn Creek, which is located on the Osage River. There he became a stationary engineer on a riverboat as shown here. He held this position for several years. Great granddad then moved to Lebanon, Missouri, where he worked for Samuel James at his woolen mill. This is where he came to know Jesse James personally. You can see both of them in this early tin type photo on the lower right-hand corner of the picture. Hearing about the excellent job market in Pittsburgh, Richard Payton then moved there with his new wife and began working for the Kansas City Southern Railroad. One of his sons, Sidney Sherman, my grandfather, who drove the first truck in Pittsburgh, shown here, established an auto and truck repair service. On January 14, 1916, my father, Jack, was born to Sherman and Cecil Kilgore McLaughlin. Dad met my mother, Bonnie, in Pittsburgh High School. Mom was an excellent pianist and served as accompanist for the choral ensemble the annual operetta, and for soloists at the state music competition. Dad was elected king of his senior class. Mom's photo caption in the 1934 purple and white annual reads, on the piano she does play and charms us in her quiet way. Dad was always passionate about baseball. When he was growing up, baseball was truly the national pastime throughout the land, including in towns like Pittsburgh. At that time, Pittsburgh had a semi-pro team that was part of the KOM, the Kansas-Oklahoma-Missouri League. The great New York Yankees star, Mickey Mantle, from nearby Commerce, Oklahoma, got his start here in 1949, playing for the independent Kansas Yankees. Back then, almost every little boy dreamed of being a big league ball player, including my dad and his friends, and several from Pittsburgh actually made it, notably my Uncle Don Gutteridge, who married my dad's sister, Helen. Uncle Don, for whom I am named, played for the St. Louis Cardinals, the St. Louis Browns, Boston Red Sox, and the Pittsburgh Pirates. He also served as manager of the Chicago White Sox. 
In 2008, at the time of his death at the age of 96, Uncle Don was the last living member of the famed St. Louis Cardinals Gas House Gang. Another native of Pittsburgh, Ray Mueller, was Uncle Don's first cousin. Mueller had a 14-year major league career as a catcher for several teams. My dad was a very good left-handed pitcher with a great knuckleball. He had success playing minor league baseball in the Cotton State League and the Kitty League. Over the years, Dad played with or for the baseball greats shown here. At one point when the St. Louis Cardinals were in a neck-to-neck -neck pennant race with the Chicago Cubs and were having trouble hitting against left-handed pitcher, they had Dad come to St. Louis. There he spent the last two weeks of the season with the Cardinals, pitching batting practice. Pepper Martin was his catcher. But then Mom became pregnant with me, and all of that came to an end. Dad realized then that he had to get a real job to support his family, and for him, that meant working on the railroad. I can still remember going to see the wonderful movie, Field of Dreams. When Kevin Costner's father walked out of the Iowa cornfield to play catch with his son, I began crying and had to leave the theater for I knew that my dad had given up his dreams for me. Back in those days, working on the railroad was a great career, good pay, excellent benefits. Who could have foreseen what has happened to the industry since then? My dad went to work for the Kansas City Southern as a fireman and engineer and stayed there for 18 years. Then he became an official with the United Transportation Union which had about 240,000 members. In this capacity, Dad worked closely with the six Kansas governors, shown here, plus Bill Clinton, who was governor of Arkansas. He also had lunch regularly with his very good friend, former Kansas governor and presidential candidate, Alf Landon. For many years, I received a birthday card from Governor Landon because we shared the same September 9th birthday. He also worked with the distinguished Washington politicians, shown here. Dad knew LBJ and Hubert Humphreys very well and was invited to their inauguration in 1965. When he retired, Dad received a proclamation from the Kansas legislature in recognition of the quality of his work. He was then asked by the governor to serve as labor commissioner for the state. Although he didn't attend college, Dad's strong advocacy for education also led to him being appointed to the Kansas Community College Board of Regents. In addition, he was elected to serve on the Pittsburgh School Board for 15 consecutive years. So, it's into this environment that I was born on September the 9th, 1941. Everyone in the family thought I looked just like Winston Churchill. My sister Jackie Lynn was born four years later. My childhood was unremarkable, but great. It was a very safe time and place back then. Like other kids in my neighborhood, I walked to elementary school, I climbed the giant elm trees that shaded the neighborhood, played softball, and during the summer, played kick the can under the street light until late at night. I had numerous pets, including a wire-haired fox terrier named Clipper. I also raised and raised homing pigeons. I was part of a church-going family, American Baptist, that was led by the family's matriarch, Cecil, who I called Mama. Mama McLaughlin was a no-nonsense woman who had strong feelings about liquor, dancing, dating Catholics, and going to movies on Sunday, all of which she shared and impressed on me. But I did have fun at family holiday dinners attended by 15 people. Afterwards, we would all enjoy seeing home movies Uncle Don had taken. They dated clear back to when Mom and Dad were married. When I was six years old, I became very ill with double pneumonia and a serious blood infection. I was in the hospital for nearly a month before fully recovering. To help occupy my time in the hospital, I drew pictures of animals while looking at images in Dad's Steel and Stream magazine. He mailed several of these to the noted artist Bob Kuhn and told him about my illness. Several weeks later, I received a package containing Kuhn's drawing of a bear and a very nice get well note from here. This drawing still hangs in my study. It was another illness that set the stage for my lifelong interest in all things British. 
1953, I came down with a bad case of measles. The treatment back then included bed rest in a darkened room. I can still remember listening to the coverage of the June 2nd coronation of Queen Elizabeth II on the radio. Not long thereafter, I began collecting lead soldiers, a hobby that continues to this day. I was the tallest kid at Lincoln Elementary School and was pretty awkward. To improve my coordination, my folks had me take tap dancing lessons. One of my very first public performances was doing a tap dance routine with Joe Nell Doyle to Turkey in the Straw for the annual Kiwanis Pancake Day at the Memorial Auditorium. This was preceded by a real Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney style neighborhood talent show presented in the basement of Marlene Jemeiner's house. This newspaper clipping indicates that our show raised $14 for the polio fund. At an early age, my dad introduced me to the important family pastime of hunting, specifically ducks, quails, and pheasants. He gave me a side-by-side double-barrel 410-gauge shotgun, which was a perfect size. I am right-handed, but I shot the gun left-handed because I couldn't wink my left eye. Dad had a duck blind on the edge of a large lake, and I can still remember getting up at about 4 a.m. to go sit in the blind where I was cold in front and wet behind, while Dad used his duck call and his coys to attract the ducks. Remarkably, I hit two ducks with my very first shot, and I was hooked on the shot. By then, Dad had his first Labrador retriever named Ebony Empress, or Imp for short. This was many years before Labs became the most popular dog breed in the country. Where sports are concerned, unlike my dad, I wasn't attracted to baseball, which was almost like a religion in my family. Basketball, football, and tennis were more appealing to me, and I was especially interested in music. Almost from the beginning, the Pittsburgh Public Schools had an excellent music program. This included two hour-long music classes each week in all elementary school and, a string, instrument in and string instrument instruction for all fourth grade students. In 1952, I became a member of the sixth grade band at Lincoln Elementary School, where I played an old Rene Dumont metal clarinet. I could still see it and smell it on my hands. Charles Warren, who later became a music professor at Northern Arizona University, was my teacher. During my first two years at Roosevelt Junior High, my main interests were basketball and art. For our Kansas Day celebration, I was asked to draw this large mural with the other students then painted. When I became a ninth grader, I had the good fortune to begin taking private lessons with Robert Schott, who taught clarinet at the local Kansas State Teachers College. Each spring, Mr. Schott would organize a music recital at the college presented by his pre-college students. My first public solo performance was playing the Adagio Movement from Mozart's Clarinet Concerto. It was included in the Rubank Solo and Contest Collection, edited by Jaime Vachman, and you'll be hearing his name again. My mother was piano accompanist. When I think about that performance, I remember that when I was nervous, my legs would begin itching. So I played my clarinet standing on one leg while using my other foot to scratch the itch. I'm not sure Mozart would have been would have approved, or maybe he would have been impressed, who knows. From 1956 to 59, at Pittsburgh Senior High School, I had an excellent music teacher, Gerald Blanchard. We called him Doc because he looked like the famous football players from Army, who in 1945 became the first junior ever to win the Heisman Trophy. In addition to being in the concert and jazz bands and continuing to take clarinet lessons, I was on the tennis team and played tackle on the Purple Dragons football team against other Southeast Kansas teams. From Pittsburgh, that's where we were, Fort Scott, Coffeyville, Independence, Iola, Chanute, Parsons, Columbus, and nearby Joplin, Missouri. A highlight of each season was the annual cold bucket game against Columbus, which we usually won. In 1956, I became an Eagle Scout. I also enjoyed taking girlfriends to school and the Malay dances. A really special experience for me and my buddies was dragging the strip up and down Broadway in our cars 
while keeping an eye out for the local motorcycle cop, Chester. In many ways, it was just like the TV show Happy Days. One of my high school classmates and a friend was Gary Zukoff, who became the author of four consecutive New York Times bestsellers. Beginning in 1998, Gary appeared more than 30 times on the Oprah Winfrey, Winfrey Show to discuss his book, The Seed of the Soul. His Dancing Wooly Masters, which won a National Book Award, provides the layperson with a fascinating explanation of quantum physics. Two other high school friends, Jack Kuhnauer and Ronnie Longstaff, went on to become U.S. federal judges. George Lampy became an Army general. And another, Don Lowe, a very talented trumpet player, became director of the School of Music at the University of Georgia. The most outstanding athlete in the Pittsburgh schools at the time was Bill Russell, who went on to play shortstop for the L.A. Dodgers. Plus four of us, all first-generation college attendees, received Ph.D. degrees in psychology, mathematics, sociology, and music, and became university professors. The summer before my senior year was really, really special because I was selected to spend a week in Topeka playing in the Kansas Lion State Band. I was also selected by audition to a mem be a member of the first Kansas All-State High School Band. In addition, I traveled to Estes Park, Colorado to attend the Fellowship of Christian Athletes Conference. But for me, the real highlight of the summer was spending two months serving as a staff member and counselor at YMCA Camp Wood. The camp is located in Chase County, Kansas, which is the center of the very beautiful Flint Hills area. I had heard wonderful stories about this magical place from my dad, who had been a camper there when he was in high school. My favorite book is Prairie Earth, A Deep History, written in 1991 by William Lee Heat Moon, a professor at the University of Missouri. It is a beautifully written account of the history and the people of Chase County, Kansas, and I recommend it to you. Perhaps you're already acquainted with his award-winning book, Blue Highways, A Journey into America. Now, backing up a bit, I am a member of the Sputnik generation, which is to say I had just finished junior high school when the Russians successfully launched the world's first artificial satellite on October the 4th, 1957. After Sputnik went up, I and most of my friends were strongly encouraged to take all of the available math and science courses with the goal of becoming engineers. For me, that path was leading to an appointment at the Naval Academy. But then, I had a life-changing experience. The music department at the local college was doing a production of Puccini's opera La Boheme. The day of the dress rehearsal, the second clarinetist became ill and Mr. Shaw telephoned to see if I would be able to cover the part. I was an excellent sight reader, but I, had, but I had never even been to an opera. I can still remember the experience of playing that glorious music, and especially hearing the beautiful offstage duet sung by Mimi and Rodolfo at the end of Act One. And if you know the story, in Act Four, Mimi, who is very ill, is lying on a chaise lounge. As her friends are looking away, Mimi dies. Her arm drops to her side, and the muff she's been holding to warm her hands rolls across the floor. The brass then plays three bone-chilling chords. I can still hear them, and the tears came to my eyes. From that point on, I had my heart set on a career in music. I wanted to become a college music professor. Thankfully, my parents supported my decision. Like most of my friends, I really wanted to go away to college, specifically to the University of Kansas in Lawrence, but I simply couldn't afford it. I didn't realize it at the time, but being forced to go to the local Kansas State Teachers College was the best thing that could have happened to me. Plus, I received a $100 scholarship per semester, which covered the total cost of my tuition. Pittsburgh Manual Training Normal School was founded in 1903 to train workers for local industries and educate teachers. Over the next five decades, this mission was broadened significantly. To reflect this, in 1959, the year I enrolled, its name was changed to Kansas State College of Pittsburgh. Almost from its beginning, music had been at the heart of the institution's mission. This reflected the important role music played in the cultural life of the diverse population of the region. 
An impressive collegiate Gothic style music hall was one among the first buildings constructed on campus. It included a beautiful recital hall and lobby, plus an excellent pipe organ. And Carney Hall, the science building, contained an auditorium that included a large proscenium stage, an orchestra pit, a pipe organ, and seating for 3,000. At that time, Southeast Kansas, the Southeast Kansas area, was already known as the home of several notable musicians shown here. Eva Jesse from Coffeeville, who collaborated with George Gershwin on his Porgy and Bess. Merle Evans from Columbus, known as the Toscanini of the Big Top, because he conducted Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus Band for 50 years. Norma Terrace, also from, from Columbus, was a Broadway star who played Magnolia in the original production of the musical Showboat. And J.J. Richards from Pittsburgh, who was a circus band director and a very prolific composer of band music. Other cultural leaders from the area included W. McNeil Lowry from Columbus, who was vice president of the Ford Foundation. Lowry has been called, quote, the single most influential patron of the performing arts that the American system has produced, unquote. William Ng from the Independence was a Pulitzer Prize winning playwright whose works include Come Back Little Sheba, Bus Stop, Picnic, and The Dark at the Top of the Stairs. Gordon Parks, an acclaimed filmmaker, photographer, and author, was from Fort Scott. Plus, there's Zazu Pitts, a film actress from Parson, William Hodkinson from Independence, who founded Paramount Pictures and has been credited with inventing Hollywood, and Langston Hughes from nearby Joplin, Missouri, who is well known as a poet, playwright, novelist, and social activist. The college's Department of Music was organized in 1908. Dr. Walter McCray was the first chairperson. Here he is shown as conductor of the 1915 presentation of Handel's Messiah, which became an annual event. In summary, there are five reasons why Kansas State College was a great place for me. First of all, I had the privilege of studying with some truly remarkable musicians. The most significant influence came from my clarinet teacher, Robert Shaw. He studied at the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music and performed with the Kansas City and Tulsa Symphony orchestras before joining the college faculty. As an excellent teacher, mentor, and role model, Mr. Schott had a profound and lasting influence on every aspect of my career. Others included Mark Wood Holmes, shown in the photograph on the right, with whom I studied composition and violin. Earlier, Holmes had given violin lessons to Dorothy DeLay from nearby Neil Shea, Kansas. DeLay later became a distinguished violin professor at Juilliard, where her students included Isaac Perlman. Another professor was Walter Osachuk, who was the orchestra conductor and cello teacher. While I was at the college, Osachuk was invited to attend the prestigious School for Conductors in Hancock, Maine, where he worked with Pierre Monteau. Monteau was the famous French conductor involved in the 1913 premiere of Stravinsky's Ride of Spring in Paris that sparked a riot. Famous alumni of the Monteau School include Lorraine Mazel, Andre Previn, Seiji Ozawa, and Sir Neville Mariner. If time permitted, I could tell you about the wonderful learning experience that I had studied with each of the professors shown here. But if I'm being really totally open about all of this, I do need to take time to mention my experience with the award-winning mezzo-soprano Margaret Thunemann. Many of Professor Thunemann's voice students, like my classmate David Evis, went on to have major singing careers, including at the Metropolitan Opera. But I had the distinction of being Thunemann's only failure. Although I had earned good grades in all of my other music classes, I received a C in my voice lessons. When I complained to Professor Thunemann about the C grade, she said that she had actually given me a gift, and she dubbed me her special canary. You can imagine how my friends had fun with that. Second, I was given extraordinary opportunities to perform. This included playing major 20th century works for concert bands, playing in the Pitt Orchestra for an opera every year, and performing important orchestral repertoire and major works for chorus and orchestra. Especially significant were the opportunities I had to perform a solo recital every year. 
In addition, I was selected to serve as conductor and to appear as soloist at the orchestra for the annual concerto and aria concert. At the time, I assumed these were comedy experiences for undergraduate music students at all universities, but I found out later that this is certainly not the case. Third, I was surrounded by very talented fellow students whose dedication to music motivated me to work hard to realize my potential. They included Barbara Rondelli from the mining town of Chicopee, who became a winner in the Tchaikovsky International Voice Competition in Moscow, and then performed in opera houses throughout Europe and at the New York City Opera. Tom Lisenby from Girard, who became principal trumpet in the famous Royal Concertgebouw Orchestra in the Netherlands and later in the New York City Opera Orchestra. David Evis from Parsons, who performed with the Metropolitan Opera. And another five fellow students who went on to receive their doctoral degrees in music and to serve as college professors and administrators. Plus, there was Deborah Barnes, the piano major, who became Miss America. And from the general student body at the time, James Tate, a Pulitzer Prize winning poet, film actor Gary Bussey, James Beeler, a prize winning sculptor and painter, and Ted Watts, acclaimed sports artist. Fourth, the college provided me with remarkable opportunities to develop as a leader through my involvement in student music organization and my social fraternity, Sigma Tau Gamma. During my senior year, I was elected student assembly vice president responsible for human relations. In this capacity, I initiated the college's People to People program. As you may know, People to People was created by President Dwight D. Eisenhower, who sought diplomatic alternatives to the wars he had witnessed as a soldier, general, and allied commander. This early interest in cultural exchange programs would become a defining characteristic of my career. Fifth, and most importantly, I met the love of my life, Jane. The year was 1960. The college's ROTC band, of which I was the drum major, was invited to march in the Baxter Springs, Kansas Christmas Parade. After the parade, all band participants went to a sock hop at the high school gym. This included the high school band from Columbus. Standing with those band members was the most beautiful girl I had ever seen. I immediately went over and introduced myself and learned that her name was Jane Jordan. I asked if she would like to dance, and she said yes. The following week, I telephoned Jane and invited her to go with me to see a movie in Pittsburgh. She was only a senior in high school, and I was a college sophomore from the big city. So her folks had to check me out before they said she could go. A friend of theirs who had connections in Pittsburgh even talked with the minister of the church I attended. Once I was approved, many days followed. Jane's father operated the Jordan Funeral Home, which in those days also ran the small town's ambulance service and functioned as a social services agency supporting the Red Cross, etc. The business was located in a large historic house with ample living quarters upstairs for the family. Soon after we returned from a date and parked outside the funeral home, the business lights would flash on and off, indicating that it was time for Jane to come in. And if that didn't work, the local sheriff's deputy would pull up beside my car and say in a loud voice, it's time for you to get that young lady in the house. In addition to this, on occasion when I would arrive all dressed up to go on a date with Jane, her father would come to the door and ask me to help with an ambulance trip or death call. But even that wouldn't keep me away. <laughs> Jane had her heart set on, on a career in nursing, but instead of becoming a licensed practical nurse, which was a common practice at the time, she planned to pursue a four-year Bachelor of Science in Nursing degree. This would require her to spend the last two years of the program at the University of Kansas Medical Center in Kansas City. Jane decided to enroll at Pitt State for the first two years and then transfer. This meant that we had two great years together there. Jane joined me as a clarinetist in the concert band, and I became her lab partner in a microbiology course. I can assure you that she was a far better clarinetist than I was a microbiologist. In addition to concerts, we enjoyed going to football and basketball games, summer theater by the Lake Production, singing in the First Baptist Church Choir, and participating in various social events sponsored by my fraternity. During her sophomore year, Jane was a military ball queen candidate representing Company C, the ROTC band, 
which is shown here appearing in New Orleans at the Mardi Gras. In December 1962, after requesting her father's permission, I asked Jane to marry me. Thankfully, she said yes. During those years, I had grown to like Jane's family, Father Scotty, Mother Marion, and her sister Susan very much. Scotty and Marion taught us how to play bridge and shared with us their passion for antiques. They also took us on numerous fishing trips to the Lake of the Ozark and invited us to go with them to Kansas City to attend the Big A Holiday Basketball Tournament and cheer, and cheer for the KU Jayhawks. In recognition of their many contributions to Columbus, Scotty and Marion were honored by the city as shown here. After receiving my Bachelor of Music Education degree in May 1963, I was selected to replace Doc Blanchard at Pittsburgh High School, who had a year's leave of absence to finish his PhD. My responsibilities included the concert choir, sophomore chorus, and madrigal singers, the marching, concert, and jazz bands, instrumental chamber ensembles, teaching beginning strings to fourth graders at Lincoln Elementary School, and teaching a music theory class. I also joined the drama teacher, Ruth Bloomquist, in presenting a production of the 1954 musical, The Boyfriend, which had helped launch Julie Andrews' career on Broadway. My salary was a whopping $5,000. While teaching, I also completed my master's degree in music that included performing a graduate recital. During the school year, I drove to Kansas City twice a month to see Jane, who was studying at the KU Medical Center. In addition, I began looking at major universities where I could pursue a doctoral degree. The University of Iowa became my top choice. I submitted my application to Jaime Bachman, director of the School of Music, including a tape recording of my senior and graduate recital. I soon received word that I had been admitted into their doctoral degree and pro program in performance. Bachman indicated that I would also be given a graduate assistantship with the band. So in August, with my Pontiac chemist loaded to the brim with most of my worldly possessions, I set off for Iowa City. The University of Iowa, which was established in 1847, is a great liberal arts university with a major medical center and a distinguished law school. In addition to its nationally recognized music, theater, and visual arts program, the University of Iowa was a center for research in music psychology, specifically music aptitude testing under the leadership of Carl Seashore. And then there's a world-renowned Iowa Writers Workshop, counting among its alumni 17 Pulitzer Prize winners plus six U.S. Poet Laureates. In addition, it's especially important to note that Iowa was also the first university in the United States to accept creative work in theater, writing, music, art as theses for advanced degrees, specifically the 60-credit Master of Fine Art MFA, which became and still is considered to be a terminal degree in theater, creative writing, art, and dance. The state of Iowa also has several distinctions in music. For example, Anton Dvorak's famous Ninth Symphony from the New World was inspired by his visit to Spillville, Iowa in 1893. Plus, there's Meredith Wilson from Mason City, Iowa. His hit musical, The Music Man, provides some idea of the development of the incredible band scene across the state. Wilson said the musical was, quote, an Iowan's attempt to pay tribute to his home state. There's even an Iowa band law. Passed in 1921, the law allowed cities to levy a local tax for the maintenance and employment of a band for musical purposes. The famous band music composer Carl King even wrote a popular march called the Iowa Band Law. Finally, I suspect that many of you took the seashore test of musical ability when you were in elementary or junior high school. It was developed by the internationally recognized psychologist Carl Seashore, who served as dean of the graduate school at Iowa. The University of Iowa School of Music started in 1906. In 1939, Jaime Foxman, remember that name? joined the faculty of the school and subsequently served as its director for nearly 30 years. Boxman grew up in the mining town of Centerville, Iowa, as the son of Jewish-Ukrainian immigrants. You will note that his only degrees are a bachelor's in chemical engineering and a master's in the psychology of music. 
While at the university, Vachman taught and served as advisor to more than 40 doctoral students. In fact, at one time, more university music administrators were alumni of Iowa than any other institution. Bachman is undoubtedly best known throughout the United States and Europe for his innumerable music publications, selling millions of volumes in the past 50 years. It's been said that no one had more influence on 20th century woodwind pedagogy in this country than did Jaime Bachman. In 2000, Bachman became the first American to receive a Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Parent Association. In summary, Jaime Bachman was one of the most brilliant people I have ever known. In the early 1970s, Iowa constructed two major new facilities for music, the Bachman Music Building and Hatcher Auditorium near the scenic Iowa River, which runs through the campus. Then in 2008, all of the university's arts facilities, including these, were totally destroyed by a devastating flood. In 19, oh, excuse me, in 2016, the spectacular new Bachman Music Building shown here, opened in downtown Iowa City. And a spectacular new Hancher Auditorium has also been constructed. I have suggested that the new Bachman Music Building would be a good model for the new music building U.S. is planning to construct near the intersection of University Avenue and 13th Street. I just hope this happens in my lifetime. Looking back, I realized that I could not have selected a better place for my doctoral work. In addition to Bachman, I was able to study with the distinguished English musicologist and specialist in the performance of early music, Robert Donington. Internationally recognized music psychologist, Edwin Gordon, who was Carl Seashore's protege. Orchestra conductor, James Dixon, who was a protege of the famous conductor, Dimitri Metropolis. And band directors, Frederick Ebbs and Tom Davis. During my first year at Iowa, I succeeded in presenting and passing two doctoral recitals my pianist for these recitals was a fellow doctoral student, Geneva Southall, who went on to be a leading scholar and professor of African-American music. I also served as graduate assistant with the band program. My assistantship called for me to help with the marching band, which was a Big Ten style ensemble known for its precision. There were 120 members in this all-male group plus one female solo twirler. In those days, Iowa also had a large all-women Scottish bagpipe band called the Highlanders that performed at football games and other events. After my first year at Iowa, I decided to broaden my educational experience by changing my doctoral work from clarinet performance to music psychology. In recognition of the two recitals I had already presented, I was awarded an MFA degree in performance. In addition to my band assistantship, I was given a graduate assistantship in music education, where I had the privilege of working with Dr. Edwin Gordon on his research regarding how music aptitude develops in the young child. Dr. Gordon supervised my research and PhD dissertation. On June the 8th, 1965, Jane graduated from the KU School of Nursing, where she was class president and spoke at the commencement ceremony. Two days later, on June the 10th, we were married at Her Methodist Church in Columbus. After a one-day honeymoon in Kansas City, we drove to Iowa City and moved into our apartment. A few days later, Jane began working as a public health nurse in Cedar Rapids, which meant a 60-mile round-trip commute each day. We didn't know then, but we were about to embark on the trip of a lifetime. Early in the fall of 1965, Fred Ebbs announced that the U.S. State Department had invited the Iowa Symphony Band to make a long, month-long performance tour of the Soviet Union. I didn't want to be away from my new bride for so long, so after getting up my courage, I asked Professor Ebbs if a nurse would be needed for the tour. He surprised me by saying yes and indicated that a doctor would be going as well. Ebbs then told me that on the official roster, Doctor, the doctor and Jane would have to be called chaperones. Apparently, during negotiations with the State Department, the USSR had indicated that because there was no disease in those countries, no medical personnel would not be needed in the Iowa group. All expenses of the tour, including clothing, meals, lodging, and even daily spending money, was provided by the U.S. Department of State. So began our real honeymoon adventure. Professor Ebb selected enough music for three different concerts, 
that would be especially suited to Soviet audiences, and rehearsals began in earnest. This Soviet tour was only possible because of precise diplomatic maneuvering by the State Department. At this time, political tensions between the Western Bloc, the U.S. and NATO, and their allies, and the Eastern Bloc, the Soviet Union and members of the Warsaw Pact, was escalating, and both sides were becoming increasingly distrustful of one another. Then in early January, about three weeks before we were scheduled to leave, Ebbs was informed that diplomatic relations with the Soviets had broken down and that the Soviets had canceled our tour. The U.S. State Department quickly rerouted our tour to Europe, specifically Portugal, Belgium, Luxembourg, Germany, Austria, Spain, France, and England, and we began a rigorous schedule of three rehearsals a day, learning new music suited to these audiences. To ensure smooth proceedings, as well as the health and safety of the band members on the tour, we were accompanied by two State Department liaisons, William Lovegrove and his wife Isolde, who we called Dolly. One of the pieces the band often performed was Hello Dolly, and we dedicated it to her. I only recently discovered that Mr. Lovegrove was one of the monuments men celebrated in the book and the 2014 movie starring George Clooney and Matt Damon. It follows a group of men who are given the task of finding and saving pieces of art and other culturally important items before the Nazis destroyed them. Following the tour, William Lovegrove retired. He and Dolly returned to their home in Vienna where they were among an elite circle of friends, including George Balanchine, John Steinbeck, and Julius Child. So, on February the 13th, 1966, in the midst of a Cold War, the University of Iowa Symphony Band comprised of 86 musicians, 84 undergrads and two grads, of which I was one, and 10 staff members plus 40 large custom-designed wooden trunks holding our instruments and performance wardrobe in box on our European tour. In addition to staying at beautiful hotels like those shown here, many of our concerts included elegant post-concert dinners to which all band members were invited. This one is being hosted by U.S. Ambassador to Spain, Angier Betelduc. As we approached the end of the European tour, Professor Ebbs learned that diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union had been restored, and we would be going there after all. Our tour was now slated to include performances in Moscow, Leningrad, as it was known then, Kiev, Kharkov, and the distant and exotic Silk Road cities, Samarkand and Tashkent. This would be the furthest any American performance group had ever traveled into the Soviet Union. But first, we were sent to Paris, where we spent 10 days at the Grand Hotel across from the Paris Opera, resting and rehearsing our Russian music which was being airmailed from Iowa. This meant that we would experience April in Paris, just like the song, and have ample time for sightseeing. Here we're getting ready to board our Aeroflot flight to the Soviet Union. I'm carrying all of the medical supplies, which was one of my responsibilities. Our first stop in the Soviet Union was Moscow, where the band performed in the magnificent Great Hall of the Moscow State Tchaikovsky Conservatory. Band members also attended classes with conservatory students, some of whom are shown here. We all enjoyed being special guests at two performances by the world's famous Bolshoi Ballet, Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake in the beautiful Bolshoi Theater, and Prokofiev's Cinderella in the Kremlin State Palace. Because Jane was part of the official party, we were always treated to special rooms. In Moscow, we stayed at the Hotel Ukraine, which is one of the city's favorite, famous seven sisters. It continues to be the tallest hotel in Russia. In this hotel, we have a suite, including a piano. Our next stop was Kiev. We were all acquainted with Mussorgsky's thrilling musical description of the Great Gate of Kiev from his pictures at an exhibition, and we were eager to see the famous gate. So we were disappointed to find it in ruins. While in Kiev, several of the band members decided to play frisbee in front of the hotel where we were staying. This caused quite a sensation because the citizens had never seen a frisbee. A large crowd quickly gathered, and this led to the police being called because we were causing a civil disturbance. 
but Mr. Lovegrove intervened and the problem went away. As shown here in the right-hand corner, Jane is helping some of the band members get rid of uninvited travelers, namely bedbugs. Our next stop was Kharkov, which is the second largest city in Ukraine. Here we enjoyed beautiful weather. In addition to performing two concerts at the conservatory, we attended a patriotic celebration where we saw members of the Young Pioneers, the Soviet version of the Boy Scouts, and a military band, plus the ever-present image of Vladimir Lenin. In Leningrad, we had a special room in the newest hotel, but the hotel was poorly constructed and snow blew in around the windows of our room. It was so cold that we had to put rugs on top of the blankets to keep warm while in bed. We all enjoyed the special tour we were given of the spectacular Hermitage Museum and other historic sites in the beautiful city built by Tsar Peter the Great. But clearly, the most unforgettable highlight of our visit was performing in Leningrad's magnificent Philharmonic Great Hall shown here. It was very meaningful to see the Star Spangled Banner hanging next to the Soviet flag. Despite the underlying tensions, the citizens of the Soviet Union were warm, courteous, and very interested in learning about American life. Their enthusiasm extended to the magnificent concert halls as well. There, the standing room only Soviet audiences demonstrated their delight with prolonged rhythmic clapping, demanding that the band play numerous encores. Following the concerts, the audience members would bring us gifts. One that I received in Leningrad is this hand-painted wooden egg with the letters XC, meaning Christ, which was forbidden to use at the time. It is our most treasured souvenir from the tour. We were back in Moscow for the celebration of the October Revolution. While I was in rehearsal, Jane attended the parade, which was quite unlike anything she'd ever seen. We learned later about this military parade, that at this military parade, a mobile ground missile system equipped with an intercontinental ballistic missile was exhibited for the first time. Jane found it unnerving to realize that such missiles could be aimed at us. She also saw many posters on buildings criticizing U.S.'s involvement in the Vietnam War. The next day, I went with Nina, one of our Soviet guys, to see Lenin's tomb. Having grown up in a funeral home, Jane decided that she didn't need to see another body, even a famous one. So she and Dolly Lovegro went shopping at the impressive, large, beautiful gum boom department store located on the eastern side of Red Square. The evening before we were leave, to leave for Samarkand and Tashkent, Ambassador Foy Kaler and his wife hosted an elegant reception for the band at the ambassador's residence, the beautiful and historic Spasso House. Our jazz band played for dancing, and two of the band members were presented with special birthday cake. Great fun was had by all. The next morning, April the 26th at 5.23 a.m., just a few hours before we were scheduled to fly from Moscow, Tashkent was hit with a catastrophic earthquake, which destroyed over 80% of the city. Thankfully, we hadn't arrived in Tashkent. But the U.S. news agencies didn't have that information and reported that our band was in the city. It was a very anxious time before our families knew we were safe. In summary, we finally ended up performing 43 concerts in 28 different cities, located in nine countries as part of a 79-day tour that included a 19-day stretch in the Soviet Union. In addition, the band made 25 offstage appearances, which included television and radio broadcasts, and participated in informal get-togethers with students. The performance tour was truly a life-changing experience. In 2006, Jane and I returned to Iowa City for the band's 50th reunion. It was very interesting to see where life's journeys had led all of us. I learned that, like me, two of my fellow clarinetists had also gone on to have careers as administrators of university music schools. Larry Millette at the University of Nebraska, Kansas, and Oklahoma, and John Lawton at the University of Virginia. During the academic year following the tour, I finished my doctoral courses at Iowa while Jane worked as a nurse in the University Student Health Center. Then in 1967, I began work on my dissertation 
and we moved to the small town of Columbus Junction, Iowa, where I taught instrumental music and Jane was a school nurse. All this, although this was a Class B high school, the quality of the music program was excellent, and we spent a very happy year there. One evening, as we were watching the Johnny Carson show, he introduced his special guest, the winner of the National Metropolitan Opera Edition, Miss Costanza Cucaro. Jane and I were totally surprised because we had known her as Connie Penorwood. I remembered that Connie had worked as a meter maid to help support her husband, Ed, who was pursuing his doctoral degree in music. If my memory was correct, this meant that Connie went from meter maid to the Met. Little did we know that our paths would cross again. In January, Jane learned she was pregnant and she was also having problems with asthma. Our doctors told us that we needed to move from Iowa to a drier climate. So I immediately began looking for college teaching positions out west. In July 1968, I was fortunate to be appointed to the music faculty at Idaho State University in Pocatello. If you've seen Judy Garland in the movie A Star is Born, you may recall her singing about being born in a trunk in the Princess Theater in Pocatello, Idaho. So as Judy's song, Over the Rainbow, says, the dream that I had dared to dream about becoming a college music professor was really coming true. Plus, Jane and I were about to become parents. Wow, we were truly blessed and excited about continuing our lives adventures. And I look forward to sharing these with you next week when we'll meet Aaron Copeland, Sir Christopher Wren, Yo-Yo Ma, Tony Bennett, Dolly Parton, Faye Dunaway, among others. Diane, unmute yourself, please. Diane, can you unmute? Diane? I got you finally. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. Don, that was terrific. Um, and I see a lot of th thumbs up and a lot of smiles on everybody's face. Um, I know we're looking forward to seeing a continuation of this um, next week and hearing about and seeing about the development of the um, University of Florida Performing Arts, which you were a big uh, part of. Um, I do have a question right now. I, I have a feeling that you could have been a concert clarinetist uh, with your talent in the old days and even days now. Um, how difficult was that decision for you to not become a, a concert clarinetist, um, a star, and um, become a college administrator and teacher. Um, what were the factors that went into your decision? Any regrets? Well, I absolutely have no, no regrets at all. Can you all hear okay? Okay. Uh, I think every, you know, every uh, music major aspires to be a great professional. That's just sort of given. And for me, it would have been to become uh, a clarinetist in a major orchestra like Mitchell Espen in with the New York Philharmonic. And as I indicated in my story, one of my classmates, Tom Lizenby, exactly did that. I mean, he became principal trumpet in the Royal Concerta Cabal Orchestra, which is one of the world's most famous orchestras. But I, I really wanted more of, a, of an academic path. I think, uh, I just love the whole university college scene. I still do. And so it was a conscious decision on my part to go, go that way. And no regrets. <laughs> Good. Good. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? Well, we still have Don here with us. I see uh, Walter Wynn with his hand up. Don. Hi, Hi Walter. Can... I cannot believe you gave up uh, an appointment to the Naval Academy to lead that boring life you just described. Wonderful, thank you. Walter and I've had a lot of conversations about the Naval Academy because he 
in effect, lived my original dream. I told Walter that I, I you know, I read about Bancroft Hall, the theme year, the, the whole, the whole bit. Uh, I even had an appointment all set up, and then I had that experience with Lava Wimp. So there you go. <laughs> Walter still, well, he's a clarinetist too. I don't know if you guys know that. And we've become uh, collaborators in bringing music fans here to Okanagan. You'll hear about that next week. Jim oh, Wilshire, yeah. were you waving? I was waving. Can I talk? Yes, sir. Go ahead. <clears throat> okay. Don, that was incredible. What a wonderful, wonderful life, traveling and education-wise. My question is, you play a lot of instruments, apparently, and what are all the instruments you do play, and why did you pick the one you picked to focus on? Well, I think the choice of the clarinet initially was because my parents uh, were of the... Uh, big band generation, so I grew up at home listening to Billy Goodman, Artie Shaw playing on the radio and on the record player. And so, uh, like a lot of us, I think, I think in, even including Mitchell Espen, the U.S. professor, uh, were influenced by those people. I love that music, and so that was how I came to choose the instrument in the first place. When you uh, study music education, which was my undergraduate degree, you actually learn to play all of the instruments. So uh, not only the woodwinds, but the upper brass, the low brass, the upper strings, the low strings, and so on. That's why my first job included teaching beginning strings to fourth graders. So <laughs> I don't think I could do that now. <laughs> Thank you. Richard Petway, go ahead. Um, I will save most of my questions uh, to next week uh, when we uh, cross paths for, for many times. Uh, but I, I do have a, a kind of a question about your impressions of the Soviet Union uh, during the Cold War, uh, because I uh, was a guest uh, during the People's Republic um, uh, period of, uh, 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 so I went to China uh, during the Cultural Revolution, uh, and I'm, I'm really kind of interested about your impressions of um, the Russia system that you saw, especially uh, seeing the uh, um, parade of armaments. But, you know, the other idea is uh, how did you separate the great music of the Russian heritage uh, and ballet and uh, so many great musical halls and so forth uh, from what you saw as a uh, rising competitor um, of the Soviet Union to the United States? Well, when we were there, we were uh, you know, official guests of the Soviet Union, so we were treated very well. We stayed in the best hotels. We had wonderful meals. Uh, we were just treated like royalty. But whenever we traveled, we traveled only at night. So we never were allowed to see the countryside. We went by train, and it was always at night. Wherever we went in the cities, we were always escorted by uh, Soviet uh, designated people. Uh, we were, you know, given tours of the, of the Kremlin museums, the magnificent cathedrals, which were really history museums at the time. Uh, so the, I think coming away in general, we'd have to say our experiences were extremely positive. So we knew they had been controlled in effect. Jane was the one who really experienced what you're talking about. As I mentioned, I was in rehearsal and she went foolishly, I think, alone to that parade. And she was the one who came back almost with tears in her eyes saying, God, you should see what I just saw. As for the, uh, the cultural experience at the concert halls were 
absolutely breathtaking. And of course, you know, Russian music and particularly ballet are really equal of anything uh, in, produced anywhere in the world. Well, that, those are my impressions. Just a quick comment. Uh, when I was in China during the Cultural Revolution, the Chinese also uh, tried to control um, our views. Uh, you know, uh, for example, our little delegation sponsored by the, the PRC, um, we had long, extensive train trips, and we had heard that um, the Chinese were so poor they were eating dogs. So as we went through the countryside, we all uh, watched out the window, and there were dogs everywhere. <laughs> so, so this kind of uh, uh, information control um, really affected us. I mean, they would say, uh, don't stray away. And there were always two sides of it. They didn't want you to see something. Uh, or uh, if actually, if you had gotten lost and not understanding Chinese, um, that would have been a desperate situation. So there were always two alternatives uh, of all the views. Uh, I, I may have mentioned that uh, where audiences were concerned, they were so warm and uh, receptive and they would have prolonged uh, applause Sometimes we'd pay as many as five or six encores, and then we would, at the end of the concert, they would come rushing backstage, bringing gifts to us, such as the egg I mentioned, which was actually forbidden. Uh, but we, we did have some evidence that we were wiretapped in our hotel rooms, uh, always uh, kind of being supervised and observed very, very carefully. So we weren't naive about what was happening. Thank you. Julianne, do we have any more questions at this point? I don't see any in the chat or any other hands. Mm -hmm. Any have any question? Wave at us. Thank you, Don, for a great presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you so much. Good and we, look, we look forward to next week. Okay. Oh, yes. <laughs>